position of the hard-pressed airborne troops at Arnhem is still not clear. Correspondence with the forces at Arnhem reports that they are fighting on magnificently. So here we are at the final video. You know, I didn't think we were going to make this uh, whole journey with this thing. I wasn't sure if it was going to come back from the dead, but it seems to have come back nicely. And uh, here's where we're going to uh, finally put the, uh, the 1155 against the BC-348 in a uh, AB comparison. I'll be using a uh, hand switch going back and forth. There won't be any advantages uh, between the two. So when the 1155 first hit the uh, surplus market in the late 40s, early 50s, and all the way through the early 60s, uh, there were a series of articles that were written to uh, bring the uh, 1155 into the ham shack. These articles uh, were published in various uh, trade magazines, ham magazines, and uh, there's probably ten of them out there that were the major contributors to all of the mods that you'll see inside the, the receivers. So uh, you have to kind of understand those mods and if they uh, exist before you can do work on the receiver. Uh, short of stripping the receiver down to the bones and, and rebuilding it from scratch, which a lot of people are doing now because some of these are in just such sad shape that uh, that's the only thing you can possibly do. Um, understanding those mods and, and being able to undo them is important. We also should see if some of those modifications uh, actually are doing what they're purported to, uh, to give uh, as an advantage with the receiver. The RF gain control, for instance, over here, the antenna trimmer, regulation of the high-frequency oscillator and the BFO, uh, tube substitutions, uh, audio amplifier circuits, and so on. So there's been quite a few uh, mods made to the receiver, but really how good are those mods? We're going to go through uh, a little of that in this last video. We should talk a little bit about uh, voltage regulation. The Malloy article on voltage regulation describes a problem with the high frequency oscillator being pushed by strong signals due to the AGC pumping and changing the oscillator's frequency. The addition of a VR150 or VR105 and uh, regulating the HF oscillator and possibly the screen grid of the mixer uh, was the remedy. I also wanted to try regulation on the BFO so these are some of the things that I'm working on. We're going to try to turn it on and watch the local oscillator uh, warm up from scratch. Okay, local oscillators come up to 4555, so we know it's high side injection. Okay, 10 minutes later. So here's a 15 minute warm up. Okay, we're about 40 minutes in now. Now, well, somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes, it seems to have stopped. Okay, we're going to do the same thing, but uh, we've. Uh, made some adjustments to the receiver. We put a VR150 in uh, one of the unused DF sockets. And that 150 volts is uh, being fed into the BFO. So we'll see what this regulation does to our drift. This is again our warm-up drift from cold. We're at 4, uh, should be 555 pretty close, four, five, five, seven. Okay, 10 minutes in. About 20 minutes in now, a little over 20 minutes. Completely stabilized now. Now, when you're trying to measure stability in a receiver, you should use the radio handbook method. The radio handbook goes through in great detail how to do uh, stability tests. So, find a signal. Okay, 
take the radio handbook and use the handbook. So here's a uh, simple test to tell how much control we have with our RF gain. We have a 5K pot and a 47K resistor going to be plus. And, you know, how much control is this giving us? So we can use the magic eye tube. If you look at the magic eye tube, it's just closing a little bit at maximum. So now we bring the RF gain control down, we increase the generator 10, 20, 30, and we're over here now with the RF gain. Forty. Fifty. Okay, it's less than fifty. Okay, about forty dB. So we're getting about forty dB of gain uh, adjustment out of that RF gain control. And that should be plenty enough uh, on that control. Before we get there, though, um, there's this uh, kind of ongoing argument. Um, is the R1155 in the same class as the, uh, the venerable uh, BC348, the American equivalent? These are both equivalent in that uh, they both had the same mission. Uh, the BC348, of course, and the B-17, B-24 bombers. And the R1155 in the British bombers, Halifax and Lancasters and others. Both of them were also used for shore duty and uh, in vehicles and, and other services, of course. But these two have been put side by side before. But I'm going to put them side by side, and I'm going to try to answer that question. Are they equivalent? Uh, I think you'll find that uh, the differences between the receiver and the components uh, will rule the day. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the philosophy and the functionality of the British design compared to the American design. And here's, here's an example of commercial off-the-shelf type technology versus one-off, sky's the limit on quality. The 1155 uses a lot of uh, commercial off-the-shelf parts, uses a lot of phenolic. The wafer switches are not ceramic, they're phenolic. Uh, many of the components and filters are not machined, instead or castings, instead they are they're, uh, plastic type knobs and they come out of uh, commercial service. There are some specialty items of course like the, the dial mechanisms. But uh, more importantly, function. Let's talk about function. Uh, the function of the BC-348 is a a long range receiver in the bomber and the 1155 also a long range receiver in the bomber but the 1155 adds the uh, the radio direction finding uh, utility it has uh, the ability to do DF on, uh, on signals both for homing and for navigation and uh, in order to make the the same function occur in an American plane, you'd need a completely separate radio direction finder. Later in the war, there were automatic direction finders like the ARN uh, 6 and 7 and so on. But the pre-war direction finder was based on this uh, MN26 Bendix. This is the uh, really related to the original uh, manual direction finders where you actually had to look at an indicator, rotate a loop, and, and, and take a bearing. Uh, used in, uh, uh, for instance, the Lockheed Electra that uh, Amelia Earhart uh, flew.
had a radio direction finder made by Bendix, an older version of it. So you would have to have this box plus this box in order to equal what the 1155 can do. And that's very typical of the British designs that are multi-designs. We know about the wireless set 19. The wireless set 19 has a uh, HF transceiver, it has a UHF transceiver, and it has an intercom system for the vehicle or the, uh, the armor. Those would be three completely separate boxes, maybe four or five separate boxes, for instance. So the idea of putting many functions in one box instead of having, uh, you know, 75 pounds here, 40 pounds here, uh, this is uh, probably uh, a quarter of that weight. Um, there's, there are great advantages to using COTS technology, and we see that today with uh, modern transceivers. Compare even a, uh, a Yaesu FT-101 to a KWM-2, for instance. and you'll see that there's a big difference between those two, but they're both performing essentially the same function. Okay, first we're going to do an AB feature matrix. This is going to tell you what features this had, how that might be useful to the airmen in World War II, and what features this had. The enemy has suffered immense losses in men and material. It is becoming problematical how much longer he can continue the struggle. A couple of tips. Uh, if you're going to power the BC-348 and it has an onboard dynamotor, set the power supply for 28 volts and current limit on max. This happens to be a 5 amp supply. And then we're hooking it right up to the back of the BC-348. Or just to uh, turn the, uh, the radio on. I'm going to do that. Keep your eye on the uh, power supply. You see how the power supply didn't like having a uh, dynamotor and it temporarily went into a crowbar. But this supply actually tolerated it and reset itself. Also listen to the dynamotor how quiet it is. That's the way a dynamotor should sound in a BC-348. Now we can alleviate some of the problems of that turn on and a lot of power supplies are not going to be as forgiving as this one so what we're going to do is we're going to put a capacitor across the output terminals all we've done is hang a uh, capacitor off the plus and minus terminals of the power supply in this case it's a 15,000 mic 50 volt cap a little bit softer on the power supply another thing I like to do is to put a, uh, a clamp on choke close to the receiver uh, power inlet so that dynamotor noise doesn't get radiated down the cord. Okay, 20 meters. BC 348 on 20. And the R1155. Okay, we're going to put the crystal filter on the BC 348. You can see the uh, crystal filter is a good feature on the BC-348, but it does shift the frequency on the uh, HFO. So 
So I would say sensitivity-wise, they're in the same class. The 1155 might have a little bit more gain. Also notice how the, the 348's being affected by uh, signal strength. The AGC is off, yet signal strength is is definitely pulling the high frequency oscillator. Now automatic gain control on the R1155. Now the DC-348 in ABC. Pretty much useless in AVC on CW. Pretty much have to use it in manual gain control. While the 1155's AGC is able to handle CW. Not perfectly, but uh, at least better. A little more taller. Still not happy with the dial on the 1155. It seems to be slipping. It needs to be readjusted about every uh, few days. Um, that dial can be can be trouble. The uh, 348 dial much more pleasant, much more solid in your hand compared to the uh, 1155. Also, I'm finding that I'm doing the accidental hit of the middle knob, which sends the frequency flying. It's the same complaint they had in the aircraft. That's why they changed the dial in the 1155 later in the war. The dial on the 1155 is a little touchy on 20 meters. Now, it appears like the DC-348 is working better on 75 than the uh, R-1155, but the problem comes down to the fact that you only have the BFO uh, adjustment here, and you don't have a, a beat frequency oscillator adjustment like you do on the 348, so we're actually on the wrong sideband. Now I got the BFO on the correct side. Now we got the BFO on the right side. 
you know, the 1155 is starting to hold its own. So you either have the BFO on the side to do justice to USB, or you got to put it on the side to do justice to uh, LSB. Okay, it's a CHU at 3.33. Okay, let's look at Fidelity now. This is a shortwave station at 5.8 megahertz. Looks like the AGC on the uh, 348 is doing a little bit better job. They're both pumping a little bit. BFO zeroed. Hundred forty five kilohertz. Eleven fifty five is clearly more sensitive on this band than the 348. Here's a low frequency beacon at 440. So we're listening to the BC 348. It's AJ1G. Sending CW. Both receivers handling it okay. But when I put the, uh, the crystal filter in, Kind of nice to have the uh, beat frequency oscillator control. Okay, so which receiver is better? Um, I can tell you right now, I like the dial on the 348 a lot better than I like <laughs> the 1155. Uh, this dial, it's a little bit loosey goosey, does not give you the uh, the real high-class geared vernier tuning, pleasant tuning you get with the 348. So, personal preference, that dial wins every time. Also, not having an adjustment on the beat frequency oscillator makes this one a little more difficult to use on sideband. It's acceptable on CW, a little bit broad. I would say its selectivity in the AM mode is as good or maybe even a little better than the 348. At least when it's tuned up properly. I think the 348 might have a little more gain. It's got one more IF stage and that shows up when the bands are weak. Um, the RF gain control, useful but didn't gain a lot. Uh, that mod's probably uh, not worth doing. The trimmer seemed to be really helpful on the top two bands but pretty much useless on the broadcast and the lower frequencies. I do like the automatic gain control uh, in, in this receiver. It does allow you to do uh, sideband even on fairly strong signals. The automatic gain control on sideband with the 348 is fine on weak signals, 
but on strong signals it overloads pretty easily. You have to use it in the MVC uh, mode. So uh, having the uh, the tuning indicator is handy for uh, CW uh, or for uh, shortwave stations, AM stations. But uh, with the audio mod, uh, the audio course coming out of the uh, 1155 is better than the 348. Uh, the RF filter, the crystal filter that's in the 348, of course, is superior and uh, easily outperforms the CW performance uh, on this receiver. So uh, they're almost on par, but I think you got to give it to the 348. Um, of course, you should give it to the 348 because it's using a lot more expensive parts. This is going to work fine for its intended mission, which is uh, two to three hundred, four hundred miles maximum range type operation. Hope you've enjoyed this last uh, video, five-part series on the R1155 receiver. We've gone through it from a basket case receiver picked up in a ham fest, no hope of being resurrected, to a, uh, a very useful piece. A welcome addition to any uh, surplus and collection, or any ham shack, shortwave listening post. She's back on the air, and uh, it's going uh, going against its nemesis, the DC-348, and really holding up nicely. To speak to all soldiers in the group of armies under my command. What a change has come over the scene since I last spoke to you on the 21st of August. Then we were moving up towards the Seine, having inflicted a decisive defeat on the German armies in Normandy.